nomad woke among the condemned. Today, we all woke up in Utah to talk about the sunlit man. And I am joined today by Sir Billiam. Would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> oh my God. Yes, you lovely goblin. Uh, hi, Williams Marriott. Uh, I'm an actor primarily based in New York, and I had the distinct pleasure of being the narrator for the audiobook of this book. You can't tell by that phenomenal voice. And then we have here as well. I am Charlie Ann Holmberg. I am an author of fantasy and romance novels, and I'm also here representing the casual Cosmere reader because I've read most of the Cosmere books one time each. <laughs> Hey, how's it going? My name is Ren. I am a YouTuber, filmmaker, visual effects artist, uh, engineer. That's going to come up later in this book. Uh, I'm in love with all things Cosmere, so I'm super excited to talk about this book in particular, and I'm glad to be here with all of you guys. And finally, uh, as opposite of me, we have... I'm Octavia. I'm the social media coordinator at Dragonsteel, and I've read almost all of the Cosmere books. I think maybe... Mm, yeah, I think I've read all of them, so. <laughs> okay, I haven't read all of them. There's actually a couple that have uh, unfortunately not yet been on my plate, but I feel like we have the full range because yes. we also have the narrator here, <laughs> who this was your first yeah, Cosmere this was, book. this was my second Brandon Sanderson book and my first Cosmere book. So as the narrator, yeah. how was that? <laughs> uh, you know, it was great. It was when I got the job, I was like, oh, I really liked doing Brandon's other book. That was, uh, it's called Snapshot. It's a uh, sci-fi noir, so very different from this. I was like, oh, cool, yeah, Brandon. And uh, then I did a Google search, and there are, I don't know, only, what, like 10,000 pages uh, on <laughs> Google Hits uh, on Cosmere? So it was, a little, it, was, it, was, it was a little intimidating. I think probably uh, a similar level of intimidating as to when I did a, a Star Wars book last year, because there's, actually, there's probably more to know here than yeah. there is in Star Agree. Wars. Agree. Because uh, Star Wars, you have the excuse where it's not consistent. They're breaking their own rules. Yeah. Here, it is one mind, one world, one continuation. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, but what's great about this book, I think, for the the casual and the not casual um, <laughs> Sanderson fan, is that it exists in the universe. There's there's not world building. The world is constructed, right? We're just on a new world we haven't been to yet. Um, but it's like and I, I hope I'm not offending anyone. I think it's, I'm not saying quality wise. Uh, I think it's its almost like one of the Disney plus Star Wars shows, like one of the good ones, like Andor, <laughs> right? It's like, oh, like cool. The if, comments if you... will just be on fire. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm canceled already. No, but the it's engagement <laughs> in this video, top of the right, whole series. Okay. Well, as, as long as Kevin Feige or someone's watching it, it's fine. But um, <laughs> it's like, if you if you know Cosmere, you're gonna, you're gonna love it and you're gonna get all the references. And if you don't, it's just a really great story with a very relatable character in a high fantasy, but also very adventure heavy setting. I think you, to the, like almost an Indiana Jonesy yes thing to it. So yeah. In, in my review, I compared it to Indiana Jones meets uh, John. Indiana Jones. It's just Joan. Indiana Jones. <laughs> Joan <laughs> with Joan Rivers with like a big hat. <laughs> uh, it was Indiana Jones meets uh, John Carter of Mars. Was the the vibe oh, I was yeah. feeling quite a bit. It reminded me of Mad Max. Like yes. I, yes. I, I heard Mad the Mad Max soundtrack in the back to, <laughs> as I'm reading. Uh, There's just a lot of vehicles like yes. having accidents and breaking down, people jumping from vehicle to yes. vehicle. Yeah, very Mad Max. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning that like this is a good book, but what makes this book special for me is how connected it is to the rest of the Cosmere mm -hmm. at large. And we're going to be discussing more of that in this second episode of more of the connections. So if you want to really dive into that, maybe finish this and then watch that one. Yeah, we, I, we go right ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I would say for the casual Cosmere reader, like having, if you're not really familiar with the Cosmere, you can understand about 90% of this. Brandon's really good at leaving hints and clues and reminders for those of us who haven't reread everything. But there are a couple things in here where you don't know who Wit is or you don't know, he's like Cal. And you don't know who, oh, yeah. who he's no. referring to. No. So you didn't know who no. Kaladin was. No. <laughs> no, no. No, no. No, no. Fair enough. All right. Um, no. So let's go ahead and transition into talking about, uh, if you don't mind, the larger themes of this book. Because similar to Mad Max, similar to a lot of those stories, it has actually quite a bit of uh, ideas explored in a, a casual way where it's not feeling like we're stopping because the pacing of this book is just <laughs> pedal to the floor. Um, mm -hmm. But there's still those ideas there, and I feel like one of the big ones is what is power? What is really power? Everything from the Cinder mm -hmm. King to Sigzil gives ideas on that. And I don't think this book ever 
answers it because i feel like that'd be a, a silly thing to do but what was your takeaway on the meditation of power within the sunlit man that's so interesting it's like as soon as you say it i'm like oh yeah it's totally <laughs> about that and then it's i thinking about that theme it is really interesting that we get to spend time with the cinder king before he actually makes it to i just forgot what their name is beacon before he makes it to the city beacon because you see that kind of power and then you get to see the the three women what are their names the three uh i know that it's like compassion but like they're called they're called the greater good compassion confidence and the other one contemplation Contemplation. but but they have a term there's a term for the three of them together oh the greater good the The greater good good. yeah yeah, yeah. and like the absolute difference and seeing one kind of power versus the other kind of power but then it also comes down to like this kind of evil cinder heart power versus like powering these cities it's it's versus like the physics of power yeah like how uh they're using it to literally thrust through the city and like the actual like jet engines that they're using oh, this is literally the investiture aspects of power brandon's writing a hard science fiction and pretending like it's an epic fantasy <laughs> yeah well, for well, sure well, also, that's what and, this book is and mm-hmm. were, were we assuming everyone's read the book or no? yes okay. everyone's yes. we're doing full spoilers full i want spoilers. to make it clear yeah. even though this isn't the cosmere connections episode this is full spoilers for the cosmere up to today so, so talking- if you haven't finished reading the book beware yeah, please press, you press no. pause <laughs> and uh listen to it and read it at the same time but um you're talking about power and like the greater good versus the cinder king mm-hmm. i saw this whole thing as like massively political mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh whole like there because there's sort of a refugee story right with the people that live in the in beacon where it's basically a bunch of ships that create like one big moving city Right. And then you've got the Cinder King who has this like kind of imperialistic. So it's the, I don't know, com- but like collective power versus the individual mm-hmm. power. And I just thought that was a, a beautiful framework. One of my favorite, like, I, maybe I'm reading way too much into this. Feel free to tell me if I'm being insane. But you have You're Nomad. Insane. He was being referred to as Nomad at the beginning of the book among a bunch of nomads. Like he is moving with refugees and it's almost like saying I'm man among men or I am person among people. Mm-hmm. And that then transitions into, you know, he manages to meet other people who are not in this situation and it pushes him to kind of stop not identifying with these people who are thematically in a very similar situation to him. He's on the run, they're on the run. No, that's the other big theme is identity. Yes. Right. Oh yeah. Who who you think you are, maybe who you really are, and who other people either want you to be or tell you you are. Mm-hmm. You know, and you've got I mean, look, I, one of the reasons that I'm narrating this book is because the lead character is is a is a dark skinned uh, human humanoid hum, <laughs> space human. space human space um, human. perfect yes. and uh, and you know and that is something we're seeing more in sci-fi and and fantasy and mm-hmm. and superheroes and all that, but it's still not like the common thing, yeah, right? And and he's um, the classic story of right a man out of time or a man out of place or a fish out of water among a bunch of people who are, I guess, kind of trying to find their water, right? So, anyway. And that, I, there was something you brought up with the engineering earlier in mm-hmm. power, and I want to just, well, we have Ren here. I want to get more of that from you because there is so much fun with the actual, let's call it the math of Cosmere. Yeah. Uh. And so from someone who actually spends a lot of time working with physics and things like that, and is also a diehard Cosmere fan, what are some things you feel like really stood out to you from that angle? Well, I loved that... Part of what I have always loved about uh, Brandon's books is that all of the magic systems always have, like, a real grounding in reality, you know, especially with Mistborn with, like, pushing and pulling metal. Uh, it's it's always physics space. It's not like you go up and you can control where you are. It's like you have to be pushing or pulling, and there's no sort of way around that, and it's very strict in how it works. And this is no different because uh, at first I was like, these flying cities, but how are they... De- it's, okay, they actually have these jet engines that are throwing air really, really fast through a nozzle. And he has this whole like section in the middle of the book that goes into pretty extreme detail about the thermodynamics and all of this that stuff. That was, was a like, surprise. What? Yeah. This is I awesome. Loved that, that was very course. Moby Dick to me. It's like we've got a <laughs> whole section on whaling. Listen, because Brandon's writing it, and he's like, someone's going to ask, well, what about this, Brandon? He's like, listen, 
I did the research, here it is. <laughs> but what I love about this, because the hard thing about, say, rocket science is, is the fact that you have fuel and, and like rockets, most of a rocket, like 98% so of a rocket is literally just- one hard thing about rocket science? I mean, there's a few, okay. <laughs> but uh, but it's like, it's all just fuel. And he's, he gets around all of that by just saying, oh yeah, the Sun Hearts just superheat stuff and they have a lot of energy, don't worry about it. And it's like, that's one of my favorite things about science fiction is when you can just take like a single what if, what if you could do this? What does that enable? And all of these, like, being able to use a jet engine, be able to fly around, you get around the fuel necessities by just being like, yeah, this is basically a limitless battery here. And if you have a limitless battery and you can superheat air or water, as we see later in the book, and that all makes sense too, it was just, it was a treat to read uh, because it, it feels realistic. It feels like this could actually be a thing if you could just have a real sun heart. I love, I love the hand gesture. Yes, Sorry, go yes, ahead. Yes, I <laughs> no, I love that it's a part of his character too, right? In the middle when he's explaining uh, the mechanics of everything, it's he's remembering parts of himself that he has hidden away a long time ago and is getting excited about getting to explain things to people and teach people and, uh, and, and figure out something, right? That... Yeah. He also specifically references the primary laws of motion, which mm. is a reference to Newton's laws of motion, which are, are mm. very, very, like, they've been around for hundreds of years, and the only thing that's changed about him is Einstein wrote general relativity laws, or no, theory, and it just kind of, like, corrects it at the 0 0.01 percentile, uh, and it, it still applies here. A very important 0 0.01 percentile. Yeah. <laughs> now, Octavia, you are someone who... You live and breathe Cosmere for your full-time job. You are here. There is a specific angle tied into the theme of power here where there's this contained story. And there's a point in the book where you kind of step out of that contained story. And it ties more into the wider angle. And I know we're not talking full Cosmere here, but specifically to this book, how was it for you seeing like maybe the most direct, like, oh, this is now a Cosmere story happening within the Sunlit Man? I think, well, some of my opinions have been influenced by your review. Oh, so I me. will say <laughs> <laughs> I'm fascinated with all of these secret projects. Uh, uh, with this one and with Yumi, we see space travel. And uh, we don't know where we are in the timeline. Maybe this is a question for Brandon. Um, when does this happen? When does this happen? Um... Pretty late in the Cosmere, but not the latest you've seen. I feel like we're going to cut to Brando just going, Raphael. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <Yes. laughs> Probably. Uh, but there's been lots of speculation online of timeline. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, it's after S Stormlight yeah. 5. Um, before Stormlight 6, right? And so, uh, you know, I think, it's, I think it's way after Stormlight 6. As, as the so? moderator, okay. I'm going to say this is a video two discussion. We need yep, to. You're right. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know what? I think we should talk about who Nomad is. Yes, which is unavoidable. It is a Cosmere yeah. connection, but it's it's connected enough. And I actually wanted to pass this to you here, if you don't mind. As an experienced author who talks about relationships, there's a very interesting, uh, I'm going to call it bromance to item relationship here. <laughs> and I want your thoughts on how that was handled because I found it to be the emotional gut punch of the story. A man I was his about bar. To, I was about <laughs> the to man this, his bar. The talking oh my bar. Oh my god. The talking bar. <laughs> um, no, like that really, it really was the emotional gut punch of that story. But, and then you were talking about like identity earlier and I think it kind of all ties back into this. So in fantasy especially, there's always been an importance with names. You know, you go back to Ursula K. Le Guin, like the meaning of a name has always been so important. And he has four in this book, right? So spoiler, here we go. Sigzil was originally by mm. Sigzil. And when he comes into this world, he calls himself Nomad. And then he's given a name by these people, Sunlit. And that's actually a name that he rejects. I mean, he's also kind of rejected his first name too. That's a name he rejects. And it's not until later where he becomes one with Beacon and he is not only accepting of them, but they are accepting of him that he's given this new name Zellion, right? And that's something that, that he, I think, finds peace in. And I think when they take away his bar, which was <laughs> done very well, because if he had killed the remainder of Ox himself, he would have become completely unsympathetic. It had to be sacrificed for that. But 
it, the story, Brandon Ox, whatever, waited until he was accepted by these other people that he could see that he can have a found family to take away his crutch, so to speak. And I just thought that was done incredibly well. And even though he had to leave um, this planet, what's the planet's name? Canticle. 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 Yeah. Even though he has to leave Canticle, um, he has, and he knows he can't go back. He can't go back. He'll put them at, at risk. But even though he has to leave, he has that with him. And he knows, like, well, I think anybody would know if I could do it once, I could do it again. He, he found a place to belong and he can do it again by himself, you know, but. I think the timing of uh, losing his crowbar was done incredibly well. So I, I was so mad uh, <laughs> that Brandon made me care about a tool. Because, uh, like, you know, the book starts, and as someone that's not versed, I was like, okay, this is weird. Uh, and then, you know, Ox becomes not only one of my favorite characters in the book, he was my most favorite character to narrate. Mm -hmm. And and credit to the Cosmere team, they really let me make some some big character choices uh, with that. And then when he died, I was so sad. And also I was having the most fun. Yeah. Um, if so, you know the story math though, you know he's gonna die. As soon as he says, you could use me for energy, mm. you know he's gonna die. Yeah. Chekhov's crowbar. But, yes. yeah, sorry, <laughs> and, and the other thing is, is, is talking about, you know, him having to leave, it's a conversation, uh, was having, God, what is time yesterday um, with another member of the team is, is we were talking about Westerns um, and yeah, Mad Max, but also very Western, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, American Western. And, you know, with with Nomad Sig Zellian leaving the planet at the end it is a very uh, sane, a very mm -hmm. Logan, mm -hmm. you know, a man with a mysterious dark past begrudgingly befriends a family, doesn't think he can have family, embraces family, has to sacrifice his relationship with that family. And, you know, in, in his case, and in the case of Logan, in the case of Shane, and like all these other stories, uh, take the, the violence upon himself, right? And make that sacrifice and then leave. Yeah. And I, I want to talk a little bit more about what you brought up here about identity, because I really like how, you know, there's the, the trope of when you come into like a group of nomads or refugees, you know, there's often media, they're, the, they're painted as the people who are like not as in the know. But it's funny how at the end of the story, you realize they knew his potential the whole time. They, they kept telling him, like, we see who you can be. Like, mm -hmm. and that's why we really believe in you. And he's doing the like, cool guy, I don't, I don't want to be involved in this. And he's slowly getting drawn more and more into it. And by the end of the book, it's just like, yeah, they were right from go. Cool yeah. guy, but also like resentful, not yes. wanting to, to, can I curse here? Like not wanting to fuck with, like he doesn't want this at all. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he is cool also. Yes. Determined like, to not be attached or grow attached yes. to he's, anybody. He's two clicks away from being a villain. And I that's feel like interesting. That's, that's very interesting. That's represented with his rejection of the name Sunlit, his rejection of his potential throughout the whole course of the book. And it's, what I found really interesting is, so he's like, he considers himself nomad the whole time, rejecting, uh, rejecting Sunlit as his name, uh, until he finally accepts the name Zellian. And he's like, all right, I'm Zellian. He's, he accepts it. And the moment he, uh, they go into the Skadrian ship, he reverts back to nomad. His name, he calls himself nomad mm. the entire time he's in the ship after, like, uh, the other three that are with him go back up to the surface and he's actively abandoning them and he, abandoning his like faux oath in a way. Yeah. And his faux. His faux. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just I was like, wow, he, he's nomad again. But then the moment he leaves to go try to rescue them, immediately he's Zellian again. Because he doesn't deserve the name Zellian when he thinks he's exactly. abandoning them. And yeah. also, right, he's not really the sunlit one, right? Because there's, there's the sister. Mm. Oh. Right, and and she she like goes on to kind of be like the leader of people, the ultimate sunlit, yeah. right? Yeah. So so that's Sequel, kind of, sunlit woman. Yeah, sunlit woman. <laughs> um, we had Mad Max, now we're getting Furiosa. Yeah. So so I thought that was a nice, and and maybe my interpretation of it is like I don't know, a left turn or out of left field or off base or whatever. But you know, they wanted him to be this thing, the sunlit man, and he rejected it and then enabled sort of the true air. You see it as a passing of the baton. I, I, yeah. I saw it as, as that. Passing of the crowbar. I think with the epilogue too, <laughs> there was definitely, I'm, I'm very curious uh, to see what 
the implications of the epilogue, epilogue will mm-hmm. be, but we can talk about that in another episode too. But maybe I, that's a question that we can ask. Like she was the Brandon. real hero all along type of thing. And, and you know, he just had to pave the way. He was something. just a man with a smart stick. Yeah, a man with a smart stick. <laughs> Boomstick. Or so on the theme of power, uh, there's the, the two opposing ideas of power, and like not like the physical ones I was talking about earlier, but like you have the Cinder King and Nomad, and they're each super powerful people, but in very different ways. Uh, the Cinder King is incredibly self-conscious, or not self-conscious, but uh, what's the word for like, Self-obsessed, narcissistic, self-involved. Insecure. Megalomania. Insecure, mm. yes. But all the above to what you guys said, too. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, he's insecure about his power. He feels he has to, like, try to force it and remind people and, like, try to hold with an iron grip. And meanwhile, uh, Nomad, who's essentially, like, the, the, the other half of that sort of coin, and he doesn't have to show off. In fact, he's, he's trying to be reserved of how... Uh, how powerful he, he is. He has to be reserved. <laughs> oh, sure, yeah, yeah. And it's just like, at, and then we have that final uh, show off at the end where it's like, all right, he was obviously going to win this, uh, the hero of the book, but he didn't have to, like, I don't know, I found it to be very uh, meaningful because you, if you are a powerful person, you don't have to tell people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and you don't have to remind all that's he is the saying. Real definition of yeah, right. yeah, not yeah. And I love the villain in this. Mm-hmm. Um, it's different than any villain that Brandon has written, right? Yeah, like he he's, uh, he's dumb, right? Piva, the yes. <laughs> he's dumb nomad. Yeah. Nomad's like, why? He's he's a bully, right? <laughs> so he's- he's... He reminded me of a Stephen King bully. Yeah. Like that yeah. kind of just like blunt, I think power is me pushing you down. That's power. Yeah. 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 Um, but I think it's really interesting too, at the end, uh, uh, the villains, the Cinder King, how he meets his end. I think it's really, it was foreshadowed in the beginning and it really rounds out That's the right. whole mm-hmm. idea of power and uh, especially when they're uh, dealing with the Skadrian uh, books and technology, so. So th- this is gonna tie into maybe a little bit more of a straightforward discussion, but uh, one of my regrets from my view is I called this my favorite Sanderson world possibly, but what I should have said is this is maybe my favorite Sanderson environment play. Because mm-hmm. obviously so. there's, there's deeper worlds I like more just for like how rich they are, but in terms of the environment affecting the story, we have like three layers of ticking clock elements here. Oh, yeah. We have the meta threat that's just hunting our protagonist that doesn't ever directly come in, but is just shadowed all over it. Yeah. We have the literal chase of a villain, and then we have a sun uh, that's a blowtorch <laughs> that is just following. Uh, how did you feel that added to this book that is already just, as you said, just Mad Max pedal to the floor? It, it was, I loved it. I loved the pacing of this book. I found myself thinking that I was almost done with the book. Like it felt like we were right in the Same middle thing. of the avalanche. That's so classic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm like, man, the book is already almost over. And I looked at the percent. I was like, what? Yeah, I had the same. I had the same feeling there. Yeah, it. it's I all, like yeah. I was like, we're 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 on the Audubon right now. We're going we're going seventy, and okay, we're we're gonna keep going. So a classic uh, thing with uh, the cause, or honestly, all of Sanderson's books is that like, it's it's a good pacing throughout all the book, but the final 20% is when it's like, he just turns up the NOS and it's just like <laughs> all the way to the very end. And this like, it felt like that from the, the beginning all the way to the very end with a little bit of like a big breath of relief in the middle. It's like, okay. Set two, let's go. For you, it's really, for me, I'm like, okay, I can, I can understand this. I can do this. <laughs> they call it the Sanderlanch, right? Yeah. I feel like this whole book was a Sanderlanch. Like, w- yeah. just, you start mm-hmm. in the middle and it just doesn't even, uh, yeah. it doesn't stop, but, yeah. So, okay, uh, speaking of uh, Sigzil, for those of you who are not as fully aware of the Cosmere, he is from the, the Stormlight Archive. Mm-hmm. And he is there from book one all the way through book four, presumably book five. Uh, we will know next year. And he is just like this nerdy dude. He's like really into scholarly stuff. He's like, he's a, a, a world singer, I think mm-hmm. is his title in Stormlight. And it's very interesting to see that dynamic try to reach back up to the surface in this book. Every now and then he'll get distracted and be like, oh yeah, interesting how that works. And if it was just like this, wait, no. Back to saving the city, I gotta focus. I can't let myself do that. And it's like, it happens so much. But I also found it particularly, uh, I don't know, maybe not strange, but like he keeps 
reminding uh, the viewer that there is something that happened in his far past. He keeps remembering stuff from like what we remember from the Stormlight books, but that created this sort of weird uh, situation where I couldn't figure out his age. So it makes me wonder, Brandon, how old is Sigzel? Rafo. Yeah. Dang it. I knew it. He's presumably really old. The most explicit age we get is that he's older than the, the, greater the good trio of really But he's really very good looking. Where's that portrait? <laughs> yeah. it's, right, it's, right, it's right here. It's right here. Hair's longer, but it's right here. And I love, too, that uh, Brandon made the choice not to pursue the interest with Rebecca. Are we mm -hmm. calling her Rebecca? Rebecca. Right. Rebecca. I, yes. call, I called her Rebecca. I Rebecca. called her Becky. I felt yeah. like that was a win to not yeah. capitalize on the fact, even though he looks super young, but actually is old. Mm -hmm. That is overused you know, so in other books. I kind of was like, <laughs> I will be so happy if he gets with contemplation. <laughs> because they're close to the same age. And Brandon, I think contemplation's obviously his favorite one. Like, yeah. she, I was like, wow, Brandon really loves this contemplation's is... hair. He talks about her hair so much. <laughs> This is the weirdest ship of, the, of any book. But they're I the same that. age. Yeah, like, but they, 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 but they all age. viewed him as super young, and they didn't yes. really buy his, oh, yeah, sure, you're old, whatever. That's the fanfic I'm writing. That's, <laughs> that's, so what, I'm, I'm not sure. contemplation fanfic. Uh, I think he's actually significantly older than that. I think, too. Because there's another uh, line in the book where he says, space travel, which is far future Cosmere, era three, four type stuff, uh, He's like, space travel is a relatively new thing. It's been around for about 100 years or so. And that right there tells me that it's like, okay, he's probably hundreds of years old. He didn't old. say he was around when it was invented. As the moderator, but this he's... is a video two discussion. Okay, you okay, need okay, to pull fair, it back. Fair, um, fair. But I, I I'm just will... saying, it's like the, the events of Stormlight take place way before the space age, and he's now very far into the space age. So we'll get to that in part yeah. two. Uh, I do want to nicely tie that in, though, because he has a relationship with a certain Cosmere character who does directly come into this book that is unlike That's any right. other relationship we've seen with mm -hmm. whatever you want to call him of his many names. I'll call him, uh, I like to think of him as the chaotic factor. <laughs> um, how did you like his... I, I want, is it apprenticeship? How would you categorize his relationship with uh, Wit, Hoyd, wherever you want to say? A toxic relationship? Yes. <laughs> Can I say, I really love that because in the Gospel of Charlie, um, Hoyd is Brandon's Marty Stew, <laughs> right? And so I like that, that they had a bad relationship. I like that he wasn't well-liked by Nomad. Like, it was different because Wit's always like... This, the fun, competent one, and seeing him outside of that role, even briefly, I, I thought it was a fresh take. It was the first time I've, we've seen him challenged in that way, mm -hmm. where it, it was, was yeah. yeah, go right ahead. And he, the first time he apologized, right? Mm -hmm. the, uh, I think there's a part in there where uh, they mention, has Hoyd Witt uh, ever said sorry before? And he does, which I think is some unexpected character growth for Hoyd in this book, mm -hmm. but... Uh, Little yeah, we regret, will. Yeah. We'll talk a lot in this next episode. I, I, I can't, can't help but ask, what did you think of Hoyt? <laughs> uh, you don't even know him as Hoyt. He book. only knows him as Wit. Yeah, I only True. know him as Wit. True. I only know him as Wit. Thank you. Um, when he showed up, I was like, "Where's this guy coming from?" Um, and yeah, he seemed he seemed like a dick. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but a also, new name. All right. But also, but also at that point in time, our hero was kind of a dick. Too. Yeah. Like you, he's he's clearly the protagonist, and we've layered enough in for the noobs to to take a shine to him because you know he's like the reluctant hero type and mm -hmm. dark past and what's going on with him. But Witch shows up I'm like this is a weird, this is a weird relationship um, that I was kind of hoping to see more of. But I guess I got enough. Yeah, you know, it was specifically his that relationship that made me so excited to see Sigil's future in the Cosmere because yeah. it seems like there is just so much potential for Absolutely. what he could go on to do. Yep. Um, and Ren, you are looking at me with glowing eyes right now. So what do you have, what are your thoughts on this relationship and the potential of Sigzil? I love it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's uh, there's, there's so much, I don't know. Again, it's like, how much is this uh, for episode two with the connections and whatnot, but. Let I, me rephrase it, his growth then in these pages to springboard off from. I mean, he grows a lot, mm -hmm. obviously as a, as a person, he, he learns, 
I, I feel like he almost learns how to love again because so much of his personality is just trauma and damage. He's a damaged person from what he uh, did to Auxiliary back in the day. We don't ever really get specific details, but we eventually learn that because of uh, the Dawn Shard that he carried at some point, uh, he acts... He accidentally used that somehow, and it fed on Auxiliary, reducing him down to this monotone uh, knight to Sigzil's squire. And I totally lost my train of thought where that was going. You're okay. I just uh, So I'm going to go ahead and transition that, though, nicely into Auxiliary as a character. There's this trick that's played where we're told monotone, not too much personality. Which but I could not read. I could not read his voice in monotone. There were so many it. funny jokes. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, it, right? There's so many puns. Yeah. Thank you for delivering them exceptionally well. I was actually really curious. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. <laughs> so I, the last time, I was, so I was on the Frugal Wizard uh, book club, and for that one, I listened to the book, and I didn't read it. But then we had uh, the artist on, on, the, on the show uh, who had written or drew all of the pictures and whatnot, but I hadn't seen the picture. So I felt like I was missing out on another castmate's like work, and now it's the exact opposite thing here. I haven't <laughs> listened to this book; I physically read it, and now I haven't heard your voice and how you actually do all the, the voices. So, um, the the auxiliary voice was a big, uh, I guess I'll say, collaboration between me and the uh, and, and the team here at Dragonsteel because there's the challenge of. If you're, if you're just reading a book and you see that it's supposed to be monotone, you can do whatever you want in your brain and change it up as much as you want or not pay any attention to it, right? Um, but to either for the camera or just for audio, do monotone is great for this much, but we can't put the reader to sleep, especially with a character that we need to have an important emotional relationship with, as I indicate the crowbar. And um, also that that is in so much of the book, right? Um, so I was thinking about that and what, what accents in English sort of lend themselves to that. And I was also thinking about how for, you know, most of English language literature up until the last however many years, in fantasy and sci-fi, the default has always been something UK-centric for some reason. Right, uh, Wheel of Time being being a really good example, except for like the the Dutch people that come up and stuff like that, and and the Spanish people. Um, so uh, in grad school, I was able to apprentice with uh, the head of the speech department, an amazing woman named Beth McGuire, who since has gone on to do a lot of film and develop the accents for uh, Black Panther. And the Wakandan accent is based on the uh, Osa accent in South Africa, so that. Um, like the Hindi accent and like some others is something where there's equal stress generally on every syllable. So both to uh, take a stand against colonialism and, <laughs> and, and to do something that I thought would be fun and interesting and totally justified, I asked, hey, can I do that? And they said, let's try it. And I, I had to finesse it um, and but basically what ended up happening is he talked like this for the majority of the book. I love it. And you know, this way I can have the equal stress on the syllables gives it the impression of monotone, even if I am varying a little bit the character and the emotional inflection of what I am seeing. It adds in a lot of cool. layers of character to an already solid character. So thank you for actually mm -hmm. really caring about your craft and being yeah. willing to bring in something so extra. Thanks for receiving it so well. As someone who listened, it helped, and it was great. That means a lot. Uh, it was, and yeah. I also, according to the Gospel of Charlie, which has been mentioned a couple of times, I'm, I'm I all think about this, gospel. Is it gonna this was my personal uh, favorite uh, cast of uh, secondary characters for any of the mm. secret projects. <sighs> so fun. They mm. were, because I feel like they all lended so much for the main themes going wrong around the protagonist. Uh, so for you, how do these characters fit into the Gospel of Charlie in terms of do you want to see, who do you want to see come back? Do you think that's possible? Um, and which oh, ones were your personal favorite? And I'd like to go around and do favorite characters. I mean, characters. like, I will say I really liked the greater good, but not for the reason that you might think, because obviously they're good people, but we don't get a lot of old women in shows, books, et cetera. Like when a woman turns 40, she disappears. Well, unless, she's, <laughs> unless she's Judy Dent. Yeah, unless you're Judy Dent. But I really appreciated that we had important characters who were powerful, 
and a powerful characters who are over the age of 40. So I really liked them. Mm. Um, honestly, the one thing from this, because it kind of counts as a character I would love to see in the future is the reliquary. I was like, I was like, I want it to crack. I want it to crack. <laughs> like, I want it, like you were talking about the time bombs, and I'm like, come on, shades, come out of the tube. And, like, and they didn't, and I was so sad. But I would love to see that again. Mm -hmm. Like, honestly, as far as the side characters are, like, it's such, everything is tied up so nicely in a little bow. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't feel like I need to see them again. I would love to see Zellian again, mm -hmm. you know? And as a side character, I think Brandon said in his note that Zellian's not going to get his own book. But He's not? No, but he'll be, he'll be a, I think he'll be a side character in future Cosmere books, and I think that's a great way to handle it, you know? So I, do, I definitely want to see what happens with him, mm -hmm. but my favorites were the greater good, just because of that represent. <laughs> you know, in five years, I'm going to disappear. Maybe you, can so. do, maybe you can do the prequel with the greater good. The prequel. No, oh, I love that. The, uh, the, no, I, it has to be a sequel because Contemplation and Zillion have to get together. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we can be written in a way where they were, but they lost what their memories. What really happened on that <laughs> spaceship oh by Charlie Hunger? <laughs> Rin, uh, which side characters stuck to you? Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to find her name. I'm forgetting her name right now. She was the, the one who drew up the schematics working with uh, Nomad, Zellion, uh, Sigzel uh, to like design mm, the, the... The suspenders. The yeah, what was her name? I can't think of her name right now. I can't either. Because uh, it was really interesting how all of the characters' names were kind of unusual. There's Jeffrey Jeffrey. I Jeffrey, love Jeffrey. Jeffrey, yeah, Jeffrey. I love that. <laughs> that was my favorite. <laughs> Just little, I was like... It, it, re it reminded me of Doug. It reminds me that Brandon wrote this. Yeah. yeah. It's just so Brandon, Jeffrey, Jeffrey. I also want to point out the engineer's favorite side character is the main engineer contributing yes. person. Yes. <laughs> yes, of course. Of course. It had to be. It had to be. I'm but not. I can't find her name right now. I'm blanking on it. So I feel uh, uh, bad about Would that. Would the narrator be willing to remember? Oh, man. There's a lot. It was, it was a two name this word. whole time. He just didn't want yeah, to share. Yeah, it was all time. <laughs> I'm distracted. And there's the I'm other person's name who was like Adonassium. It was a long sentence. Mm. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Uh, yes, I did, what was I did that? We'll, we'll spare us at some point. It's like their yeah. prayer. We will, I will point out all of us have the time to read this hear my, once. Hear my prayer, I think, something like that. Something yeah. Like that. It's we'll a really new book, eventually. guys. We haven't had time. <laughs> Octavia, personal favorite of the characters that are not the, uh, the crucial core? Well, it's. An, I wouldn't call it my favorite because I actually really like the Cinder King as a villain. And I just think it's a unique take because nowadays villains have to have this like uh -huh. you know really intricate backstory of explaining everything and it's like sometimes people are just bad people yeah. and uh but i'm really curious is it how do you pronounce elegy elegy, elegy. Yeah. yeah i'm okay. very curious about the future of elegy mm -hmm. right so and uh future of elegy as in where are we going to see elegy pop up again right so because she's like super invested will. now so it's, yeah and, and a, a common theme with being invested is that you kind of just live a long time mm. and so she could in theory so. live for a lot longer but it's also a very weird type of being invested so i'm not sure how yeah. that's going to work this yeah. brings us to maybe the favorite conversation for nerds to have who are fans of Cosmere, and that's the utilization of Brandon's magic systems. Because we are getting layered on layered uh, breakdowns, types of magic systems coming into play. And I feel like the only reason it's able to work so well in Sunlit King is there are rigid rules for Brandon's magics. You can't really bring in, like, nothing here feels like it's vague. It's all, like, you can scientifically break it down mm -hmm. and so you're seeing yeah like people from the Mistborn world are here like all this stuff but it doesn't tear me out of it it doesn't make me feel like wait but these things couldn't mesh and instead it just feels like I almost want to say it's just like people who have accessed a similar power but in different ways different interpretation I'm waiting for the book that actually explains how it's all the same thing being done differently but I know maybe that's not the case I don't know I mean it's kind of set up that way it's like you know there the whole idea of like energy is not uh, created or destroyed, it's only converted, and Ooh. I feel like he says kind of the same thing with investiture here. Mm -hmm. Kind of like it, he, do, it's he does. Use, it's loosely the same sort of thing as energy. It's treated very similarly, like like energy. Uh, so I, yeah, maybe it is. At the end of the day, it's just a different like export of it. <laughs> <laughs> a, diff a different mechanism built over the core to be yeah. utilized. Yeah. Which I guess would come down to like maybe biological difference between the various Star Wars humans that exist in the Cosmere and how they access it. I just love what it means culturally. Mm -hmm. I think it's fascinating that uh, to, to think about 
okay, if this son was going to kill you, right, how would you survive? How would a culture adapt? And uh, yeah, as they, you can see it in how they live and the timeline of everything, their day is shorter, right? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, it's, which contributes to narratively how fast paced everything feels. It's literally shorter than, than a normal 24 hours. So, yeah. so how would a society deal with a changing climate that is inhospitable to human life? Taking notes here. It's, I mean, it's environmental refugee, right? Mm -hmm. Which was amazing, mm -hmm. but, but I, I haven't, with that acceleration, that degree of ticking clock, I haven't seen that before. And I just thought that was I am. really interesting. Also like frustrating. But. I found it so fascinating how the planet itself melted and reformed every single day. You can't make a map. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Yes, it, that was so interesting. Like, that's I, it's all latitudes. And, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's really like, fascinating. Okay, so it's like, all right, the sun is so intense, it's burning stuff. That's crazy. But I, it didn't occur to me until he straight up said it. Oh yeah, the the ground literally melts and reforms every day and is different every day. And it was like, oh, okay, that's crazy. I've never considered something like that before. That was a, that was a very novel thought for me. It was just like, wow, okay. And then it's finally revealed just how small this planet is. It's 200 miles in diameter, yeah. which is absurdly wow. tiny. It's absurdly tiny. And so there's a little bit of like, I don't know how that's gonna work with gravity and whatnot. But again, he it's the what if scenario. It's like, oh yeah, there's something going on at the center of the planet that's making gravity normal. The planet's just and it works. Yeah. real hard. <laughs> yeah. It's like you said, Charlie, this is really a science fiction novel. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard sci-fi with mm -hmm. Cosmere rules. Mm -hmm. But going back to the magic, like, he, Brandon Sanderson has the three laws of magic, right? And the, the second one, I believe, is the one where what you can't do is more interesting than what you can do. The limitations are more interesting. And we start the book right off with that because we have this world singer who has been around, who used to have a Don Shard, like he's super powerful, but then he has the torment that makes it so he can't actually use his powers. He can't even fight. He can only defend himself. And how are we going to beat the bad guy when we can only defend ourselves. Like he can't summon a weapon. He can only summon a tool like a crowbar. And it's like, that keeps me reading just because I want to see what he's going to be like when the torment is gone, because you know, yes. eventually it's going yeah. to be gone. I was hoping, I mean, I wasn't sure because it seems like the torment was one of those things that sticks around forever. Hoyd, Wit, is also has the torment, which is why mm -hmm. he's never able to hurt anyone. And he's, you know, thousands of years old. So I was just thinking, oh yeah, he's just going to have to figure out some sort of clever way to fight without actually having to fight. So I was so relieved and overjoyed when he actually was able to start fighting but, towards the end. But like oh, yeah. the clever, almost judo-ish ways. Yes. That he was able to fight for the majority of the book. He's I enjoyed- Gym equipment. Yeah, I enjoyed how frustrated <laughs> Nomad was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was frustrated as reader because yeah, I just wanted him to beat someone's ass and like beat this guy. <laughs> uh, but but it was it was really cool the way he figured out. Yeah. And I, I love what you were saying about that that second rule. And just, you know, some of us were watching a show last night. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you might have like a powerful character and they're not doing anything. You don't know why they're not doing anything. But if there's a good reason why they're not doing anything, then you can buy in. Yeah. <laughs> she, 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 she. Um, so I was mentioning, um, I'm assuming I'm pronouncing this correctly, the re reliquary? Reliquary? Reliquary. 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 Cold Relic relish, you're fine. <laughs> reliquary. Any with this giant tube that has shades in it. And there's one scene where Rebecca is saying, that's my brother. I swear I saw my brother yeah, in there. Yeah. And I was like, oh, do their dead actually come up into this tube? And why? <laughs> you know, like, why would they come up there? And so I wanted to know, and this is my, my question for Brandon, do the deceased that die on Canticle, do they return into this reliquary? Like, was the brother really there or do they just die? Do they still become shades? So they don't get to go to the reliquary. They actually die and their investiture that would become a shade is instead turned into one of the sun hearts. That's a very good question. Well, I mean, because uh, he, everyone who's claimed by the sun, who turns into a sun heart, they don't turn into shades. Whereas he just got his head blown off and just died. So I, I guess that's what they were going with is that. Yeah. That, that was her idea. She, uh, he wasn't claimed by the sun, so it has to be him, right? 
But we yeah. don't know, so that's a good question. It also could just be, you know, hard hope, you know? <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. Um, there's actually something I was thinking about because we were talking about the Cinder King. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because the Cinder King's obviously a bad guy, you mm -hmm. know, and he's Duh. the enemy of Beacon. <laughs> but the thing that really seems to turn Nomad to Cinder King being Nomad's enemy was the broken oath. Yes. It's like, yes. oh, he made me a promise and broke it, so now I'm mad. And it's mm -hmm. not, oh, he broke a promise to me. It's this feeds on the wound in my own past, mm -hmm. and now mm. I'm angry. And I think it also connects yeah. to Roshar culture. Like, it's a literal mm -hmm. cultural yeah. difference, because, like, the people don't understand why that's such a big deal. And it's like, yeah, in Roshar, I imagine over time, because of this, what happens in the events of Stormlight, that's just going to become a bigger thing in their world as a whole. Um, and I actually have a question, if you don't mind, for Sanderson as well. Uh, are you comfortable with us saying retroactively more and more the whole Cosmere can be read as sci-fi and fantasy settings? Um, so that's this is a, this is a great question. Um, is the Cosmere science fiction? Is the Cosmere fantasy? Is it is it fantasy using science fiction trappings? Is it science fiction with one foot in fantasy? This really depends on what you call Star Wars, right? Um, like there is this sort of feel that there's this that a lot of space opera, as we would call it, involves some fantastical elements. Um, everything but the hard science fiction does that. Um, it, it really gets into what does genre even mean, right? Like when I write Stormlight, when I wrote uh, Way of Kings, and I'm using underdog sports story as kind of my underpinning um, narrative structure for Kaladin and Bridge 4, does that make... Way of Kings, under dog, dog sports story, or is it still an epic fantasy that just I borrowed some uh, storytelling elements from? At the end of the day, genre is a marketing term. I would say that the Cosmere has both science fiction and fantasy books in it, and this one is definitely science fiction. Whether I would call the entire Cosmere science fiction, um, I mean, I don't know. I really am not sure. I'd have to think on that. Because the more we learn about it, the more it feels like that. You can make the argument that Mistborn even, it's a fantasy setting, but the way it all works and how it's evolving in the Cosmere, it's, it's people figuring out science that looks like fantasy to utilize things that have science rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, because he's always said that, like, uh, the future of Mistborn is going to be in the space age. And yeah. so I see, like, the whole uh, timeline as being, like, this gradient from, from fantasy to sci-fi. And it's going to meet somewhere in the middle. And it's like, like, a, like a white to black gradient. I just, I hate the word sci fantasy. It sounds so goofy to me. So it, sounds, I, it sounds goofy. It That's sounds weird. a little goofy. Granted, I write sci fantasy. Fan it's fantify. wonderful. Fantify. There we fantify. go. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a clothing brand that's not going to make it. Fantify. Like a perfume. <laughs> I just, there's one, one thing I was, is that, although, I mean, obviously, this is a book about Celian, Nomad, mm -hmm. Cosmere, and we're talking about the strength of like the secondary and tertiary characters. Mm -hmm. I think that with the greater good, and with, and with the two sisters, right? The one that we meet at the beginning who's like fighting him in the gladiator pit. Mm -hmm. And then she spends a good part of the book chained to a wall. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I think they are such fully realized characters that they kept me as invested when Nomad wasn't in front of the action. And I'm, I'm really curious to see more uh, of them. And I, I think it's remarkable that so many of the other compelling characters were, even the engineer, were, were female. There wasn't a whole, oh, well, you know, Nomad's got to, like, have a romance with one of the mm. women. Like, that wasn't really in but the foreground. But he could have. But, that, is, that was my <laughs> favorite, I mean, like, subversion have. of expectations, subversion of tropes. Yeah. Like, that was my favorite addition in this. But... It, it was really impressive how much... this was the romance. <laughs> yes, yeah. it No, was. but I'm, I'm serious. No, that seriously was. Is. This yeah. was the love. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that is yeah. The, the item bromance. Uh, but I, so, I... Go ahead. Oh, so, so speaking of Ox here... Uh, what I what I really enjoyed about uh, Nomad's character is because he is an engineer. It's obvious he's an engineer. The thing about engineering is that it's really just problem solving. An engineer is just a problem solver, mm -hmm. and he uses Ox the whole book to solve his problems by thinking up creative ways to turn him into things. And my favorite thing that Ox turned into was the Shard Jack. 
Yeah. <laughs> That's like, great. What? I thought a shard fork was crazy the first time I saw that. But then it's like this whole book is like, all right, he's a crowbar. He's a, a chain. He's a giant dumbbell. I'm like, yeah, they can't turn anything. Go with it. I love this. And he's just using these different transformations to solve his problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he still couldn't get the right, he's like three times, he's like, hey, do a jack over here, now do a jack at this angle, maybe now I can get it up. <laughs> and, and he had to, he had to understand the mechanics of the thing he exactly. wanted to create. Yeah. He couldn't yeah. just wish it into mm -hmm. existence, which, and I hope this isn't blasphemous, you know, it was like very Green Lantern mm -hmm. to me. Hmm. Which you okay, know, yeah, he, I'm he has, about that. You're right. He has this incredible, except the thing. Well, the Green Lantern ring a, is the Green Lantern ring has a consciousness also, but not. It's not as sentient as this thing, and I'm not going to get into a whole comic thing. But it's like he can create just about anything he wants, but it's about his will, his imagination, and right his knowledge and like detail. He mm -hmm. can't just wish that the problem would be solved. He has to come up with the idea to solve the problem, and then see it through with with calling on like his former identity that he doesn't even really identify much with anymore of his engineering skills yeah. or his combat skills. And there's a certain complexity limit too. Like the, I feel like the jack with like multiple components that move within itself is like about as complex as I ever imagined like a, a you know someone like Ox being able to turn into. It's not like he could be like, "All right, I need a shard jet fighter to get out of this." It's like that's not going to happen. Even if, but he, a even if he did maybe. Have, like, it didn't even it didn't even occur it didn't even occur to me reading it that he would try to make something that complicated. But Green Lantern would have tried that. <laughs> Kyle Rayner would have tried that. Okay. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to get back to the sister character again mm. because I feel like there is a very direct parallel between Sigzel's development of identity. I don't keep calling him Sigzel. I shouldn't. But you call him Zellian. Thank you. Sorry. And her uh, rapid identity crisis that even though it wasn't given as much page time had an incredible amount of depth to it. Because... Are you talking about Elegy? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because there's this... Uh, sorry, I'm terrible with names. So you're just going to have to ride with I wasn't that. sure if you're talking about Rebecca or not. <laughs> you're good. Um, because there's... It's like, I can't be who I was. I There's inklings of it, but no, I'm this new person. And I always love when right. someone's whole identity is taken and they try and become what they were, but they realize like, I can't. Well, that happened to all three, right? It happened to Elegy, it happened to Rebecca, and, and it happened to Zellian, mm -hmm. yeah. right? They all started as one thing and then in like act two, they were all very much something else. And then in act three, they were all very much yeah. something else. I love that that twist when uh, Rebecca gets captured by the Cinder King and she's like panicking. And then she kind of like calms. She's like, how'd you know? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, hmm? which reminds me, uh, side tangent on that. The, uh, one of the things I loved about the Cinder King is that even though we never get a, a, like a POV chapter from him, we still know his thoughts through the, the, the literary mechanism of all of the charred knowing his thoughts. Yeah. And we saw el yeah. elegies like POV chapters. And it's like, and then the Cinder King looked at her confused. And it's like, we wouldn't have been able to get that sort of emotional uh, understanding about the Cinder King without that connection. I never even thought about that. That's a really good point. Yeah. That we so got we actually got to see some of that like. And also it's it's because it's like the hive mentality, right? Mm -hmm. A little bit, yeah. Um, and because Cinder King is not, He's a compelling character. He's an interesting character. He's not a smart character. Mm -hmm. So I think you know if he had, if it was like a, like a Lex Luthor type of character, I don't think that the Hive thing would have served this much. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But because yeah. his because his motivations are not that complex, I think metaphorically and and just narratively, I think it serves really well to have his thoughts be relayed through other characters. And I, he, it's because he, he serves a simple idea, which is why I didn't like the Cinder King at first, but I grew to love this stubborn simplicity because that we all know someone like that who is just the worst because they are that simple. And also the, del <laughs> also the delicious stuff comes a little bit more towards the end where he's like actually in dialogue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, you, and yeah, it's like just great. And I don't mean terribly as in terribly written, but like just great, terrible, bad guy yeah. dialogue. I don't think the Cinder King is interesting, but I do think that what he built is interesting. You know, it's like him as a man, I don't find super compelling, mm. but him as a man who has made these things and who has like... But you're saying there's a man in society who's like mediocre that's achieved a lot? Like, what? <laughs> I'm right here. <laughs> no, but it's because it's like, yeah, it is defeating the man, but it's also defeating what the man built. Mm. And it's like, it's that idea, like that, the fullness of the tyranny of him that... the. Defeating that is what was so interesting. Because, like, yeah, the Cinder King, 
he's also like a politician um, <laughs> that we know, but like- I, I didn't want to say it, thank yeah, you for saying it. But yeah, you know, and it's like, he just was like, they're at the right time, I guess, to have what he has. You know, he if somebody else had found the, the door to the Skadrian, Skadrian ship, like how would it have yeah, happened? Yeah, it was just, he was powerful because he got lucky. Because he got to trade with some smart people. Yeah. To keep it. Which is unfortunately so often how real world powerful people become powerful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I feel like in really popular or great fiction, we don't get that as much, mm -hmm. right? We get We get the person that's, you know, work their way up or, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's like a Lex Luthor person or someone or the morally like, great like, like, a, yes. like a Renfield or something, not just someone that kind of like just fell into a lot of power. It happens, but it's yeah. Not. I'm being flagged down that we're near out of time. So I would love to get closing thoughts from people, but I want to do something a little bit different oh. in <gasps> case <gasps> someone <laughs> has somehow watched this whole video, not reading the book, and they're still unsure. What about Sunlit Man do you think would make you recommend it to somebody? So for example, me, if you want to surprise yourself with just how many pages you can read in a day, because it's mm -hmm. going to make you do that, Sunlit Man is going to make you go, oh, I just read 300 pages or however long it is. I think you can do it in a day because it's just breakneck. You don't want to put it down. I had the audiobook going while I was in the shower because I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, your shampoo smells real good. Thank you. You're welcome. He was actually there. He was just reading it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> did you hear the shower in the background at one point? Yeah, it was like, uh, he couldn't so much as tackle someone. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> but for you, what, what uh, as the narrator, besides your own voice, what do you think? No, dude, honestly, I, uh, I love playing around with my voice and like doing party tricks for people, but I get so sick of hearing my own voice doing these things. Um, I think this is a great recommendation because in a totally not ostentatious way, it checks a lot of boxes that a lot of genre doesn't, mm. right? It's, it's a clearly established world that has existed and has had success, but you know, it's not like watching Infinity War which is an amazing movie, but you're like, who the, what, who are all these people, right? Um, and you've got some more non-traditional protagonists, be it the trio of older women or the two sisters or, or Nomad himself. It's a great story about identity. Uh, it's a great story about refugees <laughs> um, and climate change, but not in a heavy handed Mm -hmm. or preachy way. I'm sure there are a couple people out there who are gonna be like, oh, woke, blah, 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 blah. But it, it's great, so I, I, and it's really enjoyable, and it's fun, and it's adventure, and it's fantasy, and it's sci-fi. So if you like Indiana Jones, you'll like it. If you like Star Wars, you'll like it. If you like Lord of the Rings, you'll like it. If you don't like any of those things, something is wrong with you. You don't but have joy in your you life. You don't have joy in your life. You don't have joy in your life. Um, Charlie? So, people who know me, know that I don't pick up a book if there's not kissing in it. Because <laughs> so, um, like, I write a lot of romance, I write a lot of romantic fantasy, and I have a hard time picking up books when there's no romance in them. Ask me if Yumi was my favorite ever. Um, but this book was still incredibly compelling despite the fact that there isn't a romance in it until my fan fiction happens. Um, because <laughs> there's just so much interest and so much depth with his relationship with Ox above all else, but then his relationship with the world and the planet and his relationship with uh, contemplation and with Beacon and even his relationship with himself. There's so much depth and emotion still there, even though there isn't a love story that it pulls you through. And so that's the number one reason I would recommend this because even if it doesn't have kissing in it yet. Charlie, this is not a kissing book. <laughs> It's still, it's still a really fulfilling read. I imagined a lot of kissing. I'm so curious to Just hear prologue. Brandon's response once he was <laughs> Brandon, when Brandon. will you write my romance <laughs> between contemplation? Which characters would you have had kiss in hindsight? <laughs> and where? Wait, on each other or like on the ship? Exactly. <laughs> Jeffrey, Jeffrey, and Zeal. <laughs> I love Zeal. I, I love him. Because he was going to mention him the whole time. Oh, I should have said he's my favorite side Zeal was character. Great. I, I love somehow Zeal. knew that was going to be the case. I don't know. I think I can see you as Zeal. Frail actually. old people just, I love them so much. <laughs> Ren. So I, this was probably my favorite of the secret projects this year, but only because I'm such like a big like Cosmere fan. And so I hesitate to recommend this to people unless they've, 
gotten really into it because this is specifically a treat for those those readers and for that audience, despite it also being a really fun story, as evidenced by your enjoyment of the book. Uh, yeah, the, the fast pacedness of it. Like, the, I sat down and started reading it, uh, and in a single evening, I got through like forty percent of the book, and I, I was. I, yeah, I, I, I was relieved because I thought I was almost done with it in a single evening, and I wasn't. I was like, okay, phew. But at the same time, I was like, dang, I got through a lot of this really quickly. Mm -hmm. So, it was, yeah, I, I loved it. It was great. And finally, Octavia. Uh, if you are in a reading slump, read this. Because I read it in, like, two sittings. And, and so did a lot of people that I've talked to. It's so fast. I mean, it's kind of what you guys have already mentioned. It's so fast, but... And the representation is awesome. And the world building is so interesting. Uh, I know, too, that Brandon has talked about, you know, having this idea in his head for years and years and then finally getting a chance to explore it. You can feel that mm -hmm. when you read this book, right? You can see that it's a, a idea that he was passionate about. So yeah, there's soul in it. Thank you everyone so, so much hot. for sitting down with me for episode one. We will be back for episode two of the Sunlit Fella and have a good one, y'all. Goodbye. Thanks for watching.